Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ag Innovation News Podcast, presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. I'm Dan Scogan, your host for the Ag Innovation News Podcast. Now, guests on this podcast shed light on innovations in value-added agriculture, highlight important voices and work that's being done throughout the Minnesota ag sector, and educate the public about resources and organizations that support Minnesota agriculture. Today, we welcome to the Ag Innovation News Podcast, Jake Flaming, the General Manager of Fallon Farms Incorporated. This is a family farm operation that raises turkeys in the Lake Lillian area and a current member of the Morrow Class 12. So what you are going to learn today is a little bit about farming, a little bit about turkeys, a little bit about lasers, and we're going to talk about that Morrow Class as well. Jake Flaming, welcome to the Ag Innovation News Podcast. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. I think it is. As you said before we got started, we're talking turkey today, so I think we're going to learn something. Jake, start us off with just a little bio about yourself and the farming operation. Tell us a little bit about Fallon Farms. Fallon Farms, my father-in-law got that going in 2016. His name's Doug Gorns, and he's been around turkeys all his life. He started back in the early 60s, probably even before that when he was quite young, raising turkeys with his family. In 2016, he wanted to pull me into the operation as well as his son and grandson. So he bought a few farm sites away from his cousins, and we started out raising further process toms. So right now in the operation, it's me as the general manager. Doug is, he's in his, uh, we'll, we'll just say he's up there in age. He's hes still out, out, out there working just as hard as the young guys. And then we have my son and my daughter in the office, and then we have my brother-in-law. He's hes taking care of a set of barns. So it's a really good family operation, and we, we all get along real well and have fun together. Sometimes we do some crazy antics that <laughs> you would, it, it's almost like it should be on TV sometimes, I swear. <laughs> Jake, I did go online and, and look at a few different things. And when you talk about crazy antics, I saw one video of you had tied up a nylon rope for the turkeys to have some entertainment and some exercise. Yep, yep. They're sitting in, a, in the barns playing with each other. And sometimes when they're playing, they'll peck each other. So instead of getting them to peck each other where there might be injuries, you are paying the ropes there and that kind of converts their behavior to pecking at the rope then instead, and it just gives them something to do and entertain them. Turkey production. I knew we were going to talk about that today, and my first thought, of course, was avian flu. What's the status of the flock health in Minnesota, and how have you guys dealt with it? Anytime we get the flu around, it's not good, but our status, I would say, is better than we have been in previous years, and a lot of that is attributed to just the hard work of all my farming neighbors and friends and colleagues we're uh, really up in our game doing whatever we can to keep the disease out. And it travels really through wild birds and wild birds moving in and around and, and out in the fields. And it can travel on dusk and blow into your barns through that method too. So the, really the biggest thing is just keep wild migratory fall away from your barn sites. That's the biggest trick. And then just making sure that you are entering the barn with clean clothes and changing your footwear and using the proper sanitation methods before you go into your barn so you don't inadvertently track it in with you. There are things then that the farmer, the turkey grower can do to kind of protect their flock. Is that fair to say? Yep, absolutely. It's fair to say. That being said, though, you can do everything possible and you could still draw a bad card and I'm getting infected. Unless we're willing to go around and put HEPA filters on all of our barns and seal them up with a plastic baggie, we're never going to be able to prevent it 100%. Like I said, keeping wild birds away and putting up windbreaks, those all help. Have you been able to avoid this this round of avian flu? I have, and I should knock on wood, but sometimes it's just luck of the draw. But we can't just sit on our laurels and, and wait for the USDA or some other miracle drug or vaccine to come around. So we're doing what we can to prevent it. I had it once two years ago, and I would really not want it to come back. That was horrible. <laughs> Jake, in your opening comments, you talked about further process Tom. For those of us who aren't in the turkey business, what does that mean, and how does it differ from not further process Toms? Yep, because a lot of people, when I think of turkey, they associate with Thanksgiving. A turkey is really a, a year-round product. And you think about a cold turkey sandwich or something like that, or a turkey burger that you might have. Anything like a ground turkey product or turkey deli meats or turkey bacon, for an example, all those products, those come from what we call further processed toms. Toms get quite big, so they'll get up to 48 pounds. In some cases, we can grow them as big as 50. If they are using them for breeding, they'll get up to 75 pounds. 
so they get pretty big. But commercial meat market, we're looking at that that slot around 48 pounds for the processed toms. The birds that everybody's used to that they think of when they think of a whole turkey that they put in the oven, those are pretty much hens. They get raised at a shorter time period. So we're raising our toms for 144 days, so almost six months, you know, and the hens, they're looking more like 12 weeks to 14 weeks. The birds you're roasting whole are hens and everything else, all the further processed meat is pretty much all coming from the big toms that we raise. So when you're shooting for that larger bird, you're also using more feed. Is it difficult to keep economics in place? It's a challenge. And one of the biggest things, you, of course, with feed is you just have to make sure you're treating all your feed with care. You got to be careful so you don't have any leaks in your feed lines or unnecessary spills. Ideally, you want 100% of all the feed that's going into your feed tank to be consumed by the turkey. That's one of the biggest things. The feed conversion ratio on a further process, Tom, you're looking at somewhere between 2.5 and 2.8. So that means for every two and a half pounds of, of feed, you get a pound of turkey. And we're trying to always working hard and making sure that we, we keep that as low as possible. That keeps our costs down. And that is the biggest input is, is just the feed cost. We do partner with an elevator in Wilmer area that produces outstanding feed and they have good nutritionists on staff. So we make sure we're getting the most bang for our buck along that way. Jake, I have to go to the lasers because it wouldn't be a good interview with you without it. But all the research I did, stories I looked at that others had done about you and your farm, I read about how you use lasers to protect your flock. Tell me more about that, the whole laser system. As we were talking before, you want to keep wild migratory birds away from your barns. They can look kind of enticing for migratory birds to land in an area, especially if you do happen to have a feed spill and you don't know about it, because that's one of the things you always, if you do have a feed spill, you want to clean up right away so you're not attracting birds. But what we put up are these lasers. I knew Genio was just starting to experiment with them over a year ago, and I heard about it through some other growers around here. So we invited the salesman to uh, show us, myself and another grower in this area, show us what these things are like and how much they cost and what can we do with them. And after his presentation, we decided, well, we got to do something. So we decided to make the investments into putting one laser at each one of our barn site. Now, of course, he would rather us put four or five lasers at each barn site, of course. But we really do need more than one to really cover the whole site because it doesn't always get the top of the roofs or the barn might block the laser beam in some manner. But what that laser does is just look to the bird's eye as they're flying by. They can see, even during the daytime, they can see that laser moving. They don't know what it is, but they can detect some movement. They'll detect it as a threat, and they'll just fly on by. They'll stay away. They won't want to land in an area because they have no idea what that is. And it's been pretty effective for us. What really told the story was last fall, we had put those up in the spring last year, so 2023. And I was like, we always get gulls that land on our roofs in the fall. That'll tell the story if it keeps the gulls away. And sure enough, the gulls, they were coming around, but they were really confused. They weren't staying on the roofs like they had been. So that, that told me we're on the right path here. So now my next plan is to get another laser at each one of the barn sites and put it on the opposite corner where the existing one's at. So that way I can kind of reach all the rooftops. Where I did see there were some gulls that were still on the opposite side hanging out there where the laser couldn't get them. Every site that has had a laser in Minnesota installed in the last year has been free of avian influenza. So there seems to be a correlation. Are they expensive? They are. They actually just took a price increase, I think. They went up another 500 bucks. So we're looking at close to $16,000 to get the laser itself. And then you're looking at installation and where to mount it to. That can be a little bit tricky. You want to get it up as high as possible because the laser can only point down. You don't want pointing up. You might have some problems with the FAA if you had a laser pointing up at all. It sounds like it's worked well. Were they difficult to set up? Are they easy to operate? They're actually autonomous. Once you get them set up, and I didn't set mine up. I had another company that specializes in installing those actually install mine for me and program mine for me. But you can buy them directly from the distributor and install them and program them yourself. They're not too difficult. You actually will use your phone to Bluetooth to it. And once you Bluetooth to the laser, you've captured it. You can then actually point it where you want it to be, set up a plan for it and the planes that you want it to travel through and then let it run, and it will run on its own autonomously, randomly moving through those preset planes and making sure that no wild birds come around. I let mine run 24-7, and they've been running nonstop now for about a year and a half, and I haven't had any issues with them at all. This is the first I've heard about this, but do you see other applications for this for predators that are around lambing operations or beef operations? Would these lasers work for that? 
Yeah, that's one of the places I saw in the advertisement for them is they did use them in some dairy operations to keep birds away from their forage bags. So it would work great for that. Airports have been using them to keep wild birds away from the runways. I'm not sure how they use them, to be honest with you, because I'd be afraid of a pilot getting hit in the eye. But <laughs> where we first saw them really being used commercially, though, was in the Oregon area for vineyards to keep birds away from the fruit. Actually, when I was showing these lasers at a convention where they actually had a golf course, and the golf course manager thought he could probably use some of those to keep the Canadian honkers from coming up and taking over the greens. Well, I want to talk more about your turkey operation, and we certainly want to talk about your moral class and what you're learning in that this year. But I want to remind our listeners that you're listening to the Ag Innovation News Podcast. The podcast is presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. And our guest today is Jake Vlamic. He is the general manager of Fallon Farms Incorporated. This is a family farm operation that raises turkeys in the Lake Lillian area and a current member of the Morrow Class 12. And Jake, let's go back to the farm itself. How many birds a year are you guys putting out? We start with 240,000 birds every year. Our barn sites are specialty. We have two finishing barns and we have one barn we call the brooder. So that, that's kind of a bottleneck. So every two months, we are placing 40,000 birds. So six times a year, we place 40,000 birds at that brooder site. And then we move them to one of the two finishing barns where they'll get marketed out of once they've reached the optimal age. Not a huge operation, but pretty significant. <laughs> 240,000, that sounds like a huge operation. How does that fit into the scale of most turkey growers? There's a wide variety. There's some turkey growers that their main product is is uh, farming and they'll do this. They'll, they'll raise turkeys in the winter to kind of offset. They only, only do a few flocks a year. There's other turkey farmers that do a couple million a year. We go through a lot of turkey, believe it or not, the processors and in Minnesota, there's three of them. And they're processing anywhere between 10 to 30,000 turkeys every day. So who owns the turkeys, who processes the turkeys, and who are the end users? Do you track all that? I have a, a, a contract with a processor in Wilmer. They harvest our turkeys and, and process them. Most of all, like I said, it's all going to ground turkey or turkey bacon. So it's really a lot of it's going to be distributed to grocery stores and other supply chains. I own my own all my own turkeys, so I, t I assume all the risk. I buy them from a hatchery when they're a day old, and then we raise them up into 144 days and then sell them out for being processed. Are you raising any hens or are you doing all the time? We're doing 100% Tom. We don't have done any hens at all. There are some other growers that do just strictly hens and there are a few growers that will dabble between the two flocks depending on their needs for their processor and where they're at as far as their grow cycle. Because like I said, it takes longer to grow Tom than it does a hen. So you may have barns that are down for a while, but you want to still make them profitable. So you might throw a flock of hens in there. So you can have them have a quicker turnover. Well, as we all know, economics play a big part in successful farming operations, Jake. And what practices have you and the farm implemented to minimize costs and increase that margin? A lot of us are using different types of controllers. When I say controller, it's actually a small computer that runs the barn and everything will be hooked into it. So all the heaters, the fans, the temperature sensors, all the ventilation, the lighting, it's all hooked into this controller. And these controllers are accessible over the internet, so I can log in anywhere I'm at in the world and see what's going on in my barn. There's alarm systems as well, too, that'll tell you if there's a water overage. If it's too much water than they normally drink, then you might be getting a spill, maybe a, a disconnected somewhere. So they're really handy in that method, but where they really shine is they're keeping control of the temperature. And there's each heater has an independent thermostat or thermometer hooked up to it, so it can control the heat in every portion of the barn, instead of just trying to heat the whole barn to one uniform temp. The barns are usually quite long and it can be warmer at one end of the barn where it doesn't need heat and on the other end of the barn it may need heat so it's gonna call for heat from the thermostat. They also control the fans and how often the fans have to run. So one of the most important things with turkeys is providing them good comfort, proper temperature for the proper age and then getting them lots of air circulation so they got fresh air coming in there because when the furnaces do combust, they do could create carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. So we have to make sure we're bringing in fresh air for the birds to breathe. One of the things that we try to incorporate here too is once the birds get to be a little hardier, once they get past that more naive stage and they've had a few vaccines and are getting used to the environment, so usually around 10 to 12 weeks, we will try to shut the fans off and shut the heat down and just naturally ventilate the barn. So using the, the heat of the animal to help heat the barn up and then let the air rise up through the top and let new air come in from the sides and float down to the bottom. So cool air comes up from the sides, floats down to the bottom. 
pushes the old stale air up to the top. And that really saves us a lot because now we're, we're not depending on any mechanical things to be running. We're not consuming any power. It's just a natural process of just air movement. And anything you can do to bring those costs down while still maintaining herd health or flock health, that's a big plus. It is. It's mostly just about being as efficient as possible, keeping the barn in good shape, making sure everything's running, making sure you have all the any holes are all plugged up so you got good control of any airflow, keeping any wild animals out of the barns, of course, rodents, things of that nature. Our motto here at Fallen Farms is happy turkey, healthy turkey. So as long as we think our turkeys are happy, they're going to be healthy and they're going to provide healthy food for the consumer. And yet these changes that have occurred over the last 15, 20, 25 years are substantial when you think about how turkeys used to be raised. And then the farmers thought they were doing a pretty good job. So these are really some good steps forward in in raising a healthy, happy turkey. Yep, it's all about innovation and trying to do things smarter and keeping the birds protected. When I first was exposed to turkey, when I first met my wife and my father-in-law, they were raising turkeys out on an open range. And that was quite a challenge. Turkey's got plenty of air, there's no doubt about that. But there was some challenges out there with predators, wild animals, and diseases. Couldn't be really controlled very well on an open range. Some growers still do open range their turkeys, especially during the, uh, the nice seasons we have here in Minnesota. But for the most part, a lot of turkeys have been brought indoors just to protect them, really. People are wondering what's going on inside of a turkey barn. And it's, it's really just to keep the turkey more protected from the elements and wild animals and diseases. Jake, as you know, AURI works with entrepreneurs and others in agriculture on value-added agriculture. I wonder if you view any parts of your operation as value-added. Well, one of the biggest coal products, I'll call it, that we have with raising turkeys would be the litter. After the turkeys are marketed, we do a full clean out of the barn. And so we have all this manure or turkey litter. It's mostly wood shavings. We get all these wood shavings in from a company that collects them from various vendors that are making things out of wood windows or whatever, what have you. And they're collecting these wood shavings that would otherwise be wasted. And we're using it to in the barns as bedding. And so we're adding a value to it by letting the animals live in it for a period of time. We're creating this, this high nutrient source for plants. If you talk to any agronomist, they'll tell you that turkey litter is probably one of the strongest fertilizers you can put in your fields. It's really very high in nitrogen and it has a lot of other products to go with it. Do you farm land as well or just raise birds? We just raise birds. We do have some farmland we're invested in, but we, we pretty much rent that all out. Our, our motto is, is pretty much along the good to better route. It's a book that I read a few years ago, good to great. And we're just focusing on the one thing we, need to, we know we can be the best at, and that's raising good turkeys. So we'll let someone else farm the land, raise the crops, let another person make the feed, and let somebody else process the birds. We're just going to focus on the one thing we know the best, and that is keeping turkeys happy and healthy. I want to spend the last few minutes that we have together to talk about your Marl class a little bit. AURI has supported Marl program for many years, and I know you're part of Marl class 12. So maybe a little background, Jake. What is Marl? The Marl is an acronym and stands for Minnesota Agricultural Rural Leadership. It's a place where we can develop leaders within a state that are going to help push agriculture and rural leadership forward in Minnesota and we might get people that are, like, for example, for myself, I am president of the Minnesota Turkey Growers Association, so I'm in a position of agricultural leadership. Marl is hoping to grow other people into those type of positions, and it could be anywhere from taking a membership on a board for a co-op or for a commodity group, getting into leadership, or even running for a political office. That's really what Marl is introducing people into. And for me, it's really given me a lot of confidence to actually take on a position as president for Minnesota Turkey. Do you think Marl has had an impact on your farming operation? I think so. It's really hard to quantify that because I, you implement these everything you learn in small doses day in and day out. For me to look at it and really tell you, I can point to an exact impact that's changed stuff. It's really hard to see that. But when I was talking to my wife about it, she did notice quite some things that were working better. And my family said the same thing too, that they've, they felt that we were more organized and got better communication and, and things of that nature that were or war. Of a, of a group. We're all kind of rowing a, rowing a boat in the same direction. And I would attribute that to some of my leadership skills and trying to inspire a shared vision amongst everybody who's working at the farm, holding meetings and just be able to talk people through processes and what they want to see, pulling ideas out of them that we can try and share with everybody that, oh yeah, we never thought about that way before. We should try X, Y, Z. 
For those who don't know, Morrow participants believe it's still a two-year program, and they are asked to take on a capstone project and work on that. What's your capstone project, Jake, and how close are you to completion on it? It started. I don't know if it'll ever really be complete. So what I am doing is I started a Facebook page working at learning how to do better at social media. But my ultimate goal is, what my capstone project really is to sum it up, I'm going to virtually open the barn doors for the consumer so they can see what we do every day to help raise happy and healthy turkeys and provide an excellent protein source for America, really. My barns aren't that unique compared to other barns. We all, all growers have similar practices. There's some practices that are different, but every turkey grower I know, the one thing we always want is we want to have the happiest and healthy birds. It's just good economics. You don't want to abuse or ignore your birds at all because it's just not going to pay off for you in the long run. And so we can go online on Facebook, I should say. I went there a little bit, looked around. Yeah, I, that's where I saw the turkeys playing with the rubber or the plastic twine. I saw you get, trying to get a cover off a feed bin. Don't know what a turkey operation looks like. Here's an opportunity to go and look at one. And one that Jake is comfortable showing you and you're raising healthy birds and happy birds and they're on their way to your table. It's interesting. This all started because we're all together in a WhatsApp group. And I would share videos of things that I was doing on the farm and everybody found that interesting. So that's where I got the inspiration to do this on a larger scale and make it public. So it's called Turkey Jake. That's the webpage. And the reason why I came up with that name is that's the moniker my classmates gave me was Turkey Jake. Really, it's because we have two people in our class that are named Jake. And so to differentiate the two of us, I was Turkey Jake. So that's that's the name of the webpage. <laughs> and you're comfortable with that? I'm comfortable with that. And it actually makes sense because a Jake is actually a, an adolescent male turkey. If you're a wild turkey hunter, you'll know what a Jake is. We'll wrap things up just with your thoughts about the turkey industry, certainly, but your farm and your farming operation, very deeply involved with the whole family. What does the future look like, in your opinion, not only for your farm, but for the turkey industry in Minnesota? That's something I should point out. Minnesota is number one in, in turkey production in, in the U.S. I think it looks pretty good. We've got some strong young people coming up. I've actually met a few growers who are starting to slowly turn the reins over to their sons and daughters. I really see continue on to be a powerful market within our economy in Minnesota. For our farm here, still really too new to know, but I really am hoping someday that the next generation will want to take over. It took my father-in-law. He, he's still he's still active and he's in the 70s. I'm in my 50s now, so I'm really looking down at my son and daughter and where they're going to be coming up. But it'll probably be another 20, 30 years before we're really looking at really getting them to take over management and take over control of the farm probably. But yeah, there's a lot of possibilities in there and we'll see what happens. Jake, it's been a pleasure. You've shared some great information and we've learned a lot about raising turkeys in Minnesota and your particular farming operation. I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you. And anybody is curious, like I said, go to Turkey Jake on Facebook and like and follow so you can follow the flock. We've been visiting today with Jake Blomick, part of the Marl Class 12, also the general manager of Fallum Farms, a turkey growing operation in Lake Lillian, Minnesota. I want to thank everyone for joining us today and thank you for listening to the Egg Innovation News Podcast presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. I want to thank my podcast crew of one, Lisa Martinez, AURI Communications Manager and Editor of this production. To learn more about AURI, go to auri.org.